What's up everyone? Welcome to another interview from bodyhack.com. My name is Spencer. Today we're talking to James Fitzgerald. James won the CrossFit Games back in 2007, the first year they began. And he also runs a training company called OPT, Optimum Performance Training. In this interview, James shares some of his experiences from the CrossFit Games and some of the stories of, of what he went through, uh, what everyone went through. But to hear someone that went through all that tell it from their own personal recollection and point of view is really cool. He takes us through how his training evolved and how the coaching certification program came about through work with his business and life mentor, the late Bernie Nowakowski. Tragically, Bernie passed away about a week prior to us recording this interview. Bernie had developed a system called higher order thinking, which James explains a little bit about. So all in all, this was probably one of my favorite interviews. I think you're gonna learn a lot. And like I said at the beginning, the stories that James shares, awesome. Enjoy. James is the founder of OPT, Optimum Performance Training, based out of Scottsdale, Arizona, and a full-time husband, father, and fitness athlete. His 16-plus years of experience in service as a strength coach slash technician, tireless practice on refining energy system work, nutritional and lifestyle balancing techniques, and training of other coaches has made OPT a sought-after method of bringing fitness to a higher order. How are you doing, James? I'm great, thank you. Good, Good morning. Man. Morning. So, first question: Before discovering CrossFit, what were you doing for physical activity? Um, through high school, uh, basically, I had physical activity through sport, um, and fitness wasn't even uh, registered in the conscious. Um, and then I had an injury, and that led me into understanding through physical therapy how you had to do conditioning in order to get better. Mm -hmm. And then through doing physical conditioning as to how to get better. Uh, that led me to understand how important physical conditioning or general physical prep or fitness could have made all my previous experiences in sport a whole lot better. So I just started going down the um, the, the the road on trying to understand exercise physiology. So went through university and through those periods of time, uh, fitness, just like most people, only let's say uh, you know fifteen to twenty years ago, fitness was bodybuilding really, bodybuilding or aerobics or um, uh, competitive athletics. That's pretty much what it was. And uh, we can, you know, people have different philosophies on what that could have been, but pretty much that's all it was. It was either strength conditioning and bodybuilding, and then there was different families within that. So I, I, that was my physical activity preference for uh, many years, was going through um, bodybuilding, powerlifting, strength conditioning, and basically just trying to understand uh, principles of strength conditioning um, for numerous years up to um, 2005 um, in which I discovered CrossFit and um, basically had a completely you know shift in perspective on what conditioning is and as, as if, if, if listeners don't understand what CrossFit is then uh, to come from like a conditioning background of just strength and conditioning um, it was kind of faux pas to start doing, you know, touch and go power cleans and running along with it. Um, so I had to do it in my basement on my own, um, because I'd be shunned basically from the strength conditioning community. Um, but I learned a bunch of things because I was open minded to basically just seeing like what this, what this piece of fitness is. Um, yeah. And, uh, it, it went from there basically. Okay. And. From the powerlifting and and the other conditioning programs you were doing, were you getting results from those? Yeah. Um, well, when it was specific uh, relative to what I was trying to do. So if we go back to um, that period of time for strength conditioning, my goal was um, like every uh, kid and coach who was um, um, you know reading Muscle Media two thousand or. Um, you know, on forums with Dan Duchesne or, you know, interviews with Charles Polquin or mm -hmm. um, more to Pasquale or these legends online, you're basically trying to figure out how to get uh, increased lean mass and stay as lean as possible. So um, for me and my makeup, um, it was really hard for me to gain lean mass. So basically, I did see progress, but it, it was half and half because I also wanted to teach other people about it too. And I saw their progresses. Um, in terms of what it took in order to get there, so it, it upgraded my own prescription. So, for lean mass development, when I focused specifically on it, I did get it, um, and I had this, you know, the secrets of how to do it best for me. And obviously, with doing it with hundreds of clients, I also found 
ways of improving that prescription. When it came to just getting stronger, I was also capable of doing that too when followed a specific program. Mm-hmm. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, when I specialized in specific areas, there was there was progress. Okay, and what motivated you to switch to CrossFit? Or to at least to, not switch, but to yeah. take a look? Well, yeah, no, I get your, uh, I get your question. Um, I think it was a natural evolution of that 50-50 that I said, that 50% of me was was conditioning just to stay in shape and look good. And the other 50% was a learning piece. So I was still a student, and I still am a student, and trying to learn from you know what? What's the you know, what's the best fitness prescription? Uh, and mm-hmm. the more and more you go, you go down that rabbit hole, you start to discover that uh, there is no perfect fitness prescription because everyone is so individual based upon what they want to do, and they hold the key for their goals for that. But um, when I did change, um, it just um, it led me down this um, um, you know. Um, path of this uh, uh, awakening and, and uh, being being more open to a whole different perspective. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to talk a bit about that too when you switched to CrossFit because I was watching a video of you speaking online and it, I believe it was at the Black Box Summit. Yeah. And uh, it was a presentation you were saying that CrossFit showed you that you weren't as tough as you thought. Can you expand mm-hmm. on that a bit? Yeah. Um, the toughness piece probably came from my vocabulary because I was doing a Toughest Calgary in a Live competition. This was in 2001. Uh, 2000 where there was like the toughest fireman alive there was different kinds of competitions on a full day event that uh, uh, myself and my colleagues used to participate in Um, and you know it was your version of toughness so basically it was a full day event with standardized tests and measurements for example like a rope climb for speed 80 meter sprint um, 100 meter swim sprint uh, 5k trail run bench press maximum uh, strict chin up pronated maximum obstacle course and something else and this was in the form of a day right mm-hmm. and so there was a bunch of different fitness test measures so you know I thought that with my conditioning it was tough but uh, really with all my experiences with what I know in terms of energy system training too um, I had either done you know uh, strength training protocols so short kind of uh, Let's say even with weight training up to you know intervals, nothing more than a minute. Let's say okay, okay. and then I also did uh, lots of running because running was mixed in with all those programs as well in my conditioning, um, and I always was a good runner even as I started gaining weight even through those bodybuilding and powerlifting protocols. I was still competing in running, and I continued to do that as I started CrossFit as well. So I was either at two ends of the spectrum. I was either doing short, fast, heavy shit, or longer stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and this middle ground piece, I believe, is the um, is the thing that people get caught up in in terms of understanding CrossFit too, and in terms. And I think it's the I think it's the most potent piece of fitness that we as coaches have to work with. But when I say potent, um, I mean if used incorrectly, it's horrible. And so, um, if used correctly, I think it's magical and almost spiritual, as as weird as it sounds. Um, so the, that piece in CrossFit I discovered and was completely not in my vocabulary. So I couldn't even resonate with it as to what it, what it felt like to go that hard for three to five to seven minutes, you know, Mm -hmm. um, because I had done this real short shit and this real long stuff. So when I started doing that stuff, you know, um, there was stuff in my psyche that really challenged my, my makeup. And so it uh, it said you know you know you thought you were tough with toughness being you know fitness from my eyes, and then I'm given a whole different uh, perspective on it. Then I realized that that mental transformation uh, had to occur, and, and uh, it did. It taught me a lot over time. I'm very grateful for that. And you talked about a guy, uh, Brett Marshall, AFT. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, and you, yes. you said he basically kicked your ass for like a year or two in a row. What was that was, like going through that? It was more than a couple of years. Yeah. Um, or more than two years. I think we started together because we, we were training partners from 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what people seem to forget about uh, Brett and I is that um, we experienced a lot of stuff together uh, for many years. Um, so from 2000 up till, um, you know, really 2007 or eight. Uh, we pretty much went head to head on whatever we did, even before CrossFit, and uh, it was just a great partnership. As you know, g- guys who know, and then you have a good training partner. It's very tough to come by, um, mm-hmm. but they're invaluable. 
So then we started doing CrossFit stuff relative to also Brett being busy with doing some coaching and also firefighting. Um, you know, I basically, uh, we all got caught up in this CrossFit phenomenon because um, it was this new thing that, you know, we tried to understand in terms of fitness. So I would uh, basically come in every morning, early morning, because that was my workout time, and just hammer that workout. Um, and every workout that was posted, we put our scores on the board. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, of course, Brett would come in later in the day trying to fit it in because he was so busy. And uh, he, would, he would nail it every time, you know, and uh, beat me by a couple seconds here and there, or sometimes just smash it. And um, He had periods... Um, which people don't seem to, you know, recognize because he came uh, um, second place at the games, the first games, the first year. Um, he did stuff in terms of physical capabilities that people just, you know, you don't recognize, you, you can't comprehend based upon his body weight and his power output. Um, it's kind of like this kind of stuff that Josh Bridges is doing today, if you recognize that name. Mm -hmm. um, if you know his body weight and power output, if you were to put a power meter on him, Brett had that same kind of power meter in the infancy of the sport, um, which is uh, which was ridiculous. Anyways, side note, yeah, he would come in and basically kick the crap out of me for those scores for a number of years. And then, of course, the games came up and uh, we were like, man, you know, we've been doing this every morning every day for a couple of years let's just get together with all these guys we wanted to see josh everett and compete against uh jeremy teal and test our test our strengths against uh breck berry and uh and um chris spieler and um you know a number of the guys that uh we were looking up to on mm -hmm. the um hope it, hope we were hoping greg munson was going to show up too but yeah uh, he wasn't able at that year but so we went down there in hopes of basically just you know uh seeing those guys basically you know we've been online friends for a while and uh, josh bridges was on there at the time too but he couldn't compete i think he was he's gone away on work but um <clears throat> yeah he would uh, brett would take me down on all those workouts for a couple of years and then the way the stars aligned in 2007 is that uh um i just edged him out based upon just uh, the strength lifts you know on the sunday we had a crossfit total and i got him in a few pounds and mm -hmm the only difference otherwise i think the histories would have changed tremendously With that and that was in the 2007 games yes was yeah. brett you were in the 2008 games right uh yes was brett as well in those ones yes yeah yes brett didn't plan on competing in the 2008 games um but he came down and uh dave castro met him on that day or the day before he was like hey man we can fit you into a spot if you want Brett was like yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> and awesome. uh and knowing his abilities, um, well, for, I'll back this up. First and foremost, Brett and I were smashed from 2007. Mm -hmm. um, so we basically culminated a few months of hard training, and we got there, and we, you know, we were wrecked. So we were happy, and it was fun, but we were wrecked. Um, so for a couple of months after, you know, Brett and I were like, well, you know, I'm not sure we want to go back and do that stuff again. And then 2008, I hadn't planned on it either, but there was a movie coming up and, you know, all the drama that went on with that and the, mm -hmm. the participation, continued participation in the sport and stuff. So um, I forced it and forced it and really I was injured and keep getting injuring myself, but it led into the, to the 2008 games, which was the movie compilation, Every Second Counts. But yeah, so he went down there and uh, didn't come back to participate because the night before or something, he had downed a couple of burgers and had, you know, a smoothie and, or a frickin' milkshake. And it was a funny story anyways. But, um, but if you go back and look at those scores for that day, um, I mean, those are Brett's workouts. You know, besides the heavy deadlift burpee, um, cause the deadlift wasn't that his strength relative to the 1RM, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's his shit. That was yeah. his style. But then Sunday with the repetitions and the amount of work that ha he had to do for the high power work, he just wasn't, you know, prepped physically relative to the demand for that workout. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if he had stayed trained and probably not had, you know, a couple of weeks of being off on training or whatever, if he had trained specifically for that, um, I, I would argue that he would be in the, he would have been in the top five um, of the 2008 games as well. Mm -hmm. But that last workout just uh, took a beating on him. And, uh, you know, when you get to, when we got to like rep 20, 21, uh, or 18 and Kalipa's done and everyone starts finishing, you know, and you're out there all alone, that little cage, it's like, fuck, yeah. let's just get this over with, you know? Yeah. 
it, got, it didn't come down to like seconds in time then it was basically like Jesus this is embarrassing let's just stop this you know mm-hmm. but you knew you had to finish because otherwise you know, it'd be 50th place yeah there's no but Brett, Brett had that mentality he was like he's either going to win it or he's going to come 100th and uh, that's what I liked about him you know yeah. and that's why when you look at his scores where he finished it's not relation it's not relative to um, to how he finished that year um, and people who were around at that time knew that too so and in the 2009 games, that's those are the ones where there was that chipper at the end. I believe I watched this online. Yeah, and you you looked like you were going to die. That was, yeah, that was the that was one of the toughest ones. I mean, I haven't I haven't participated fully in all the 2010 11 uh, games, so I can't you know comment on that. But the 2009 games was uh, was quite challenging. Again, I was not planning on competing. It you know after 2008 with the drama, I went through a big you know, emotional, you know, checkup on who I was and what I wanted to do. And I really got caught up in, you know, the OPT and um, not who I was as a person and a coach. And so I wanted to go down that road. And still to this day, I, I want to share CrossFit and, and coaching with people. Um, and there's some disparities or loss of perception on where that is. I'm not sure where that got started, but I... I wanted since the 2008 games to start teaching people about this, and I still do it to, to this day. It's my, it's pretty much my full time gig. Within it, I get lots of great fitness prescriptions, but I still coach people within that sport. So I wanted to do the same thing going to 2009. But Greg and Dave called me up and said, you know, it's going to be the, the biggest one yet, and you know, yeah. it's, you know, and so you know, you know, it's like, oh Jesus, you know, <laughs> how do I not say no to that? And so. It was. I remember the phone call was May, and I started training. I still have my log. Um, it's actually right here. <laughs> Ironically, I keep it real close to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I have the log of all the training that I did, um, specifically every day, um, up to from. See, I even had like May thirtieth, um, and every workout that I had it planned, as well as um, I had it leading up what it would look like. So I planned out specifically after the phone call uh, from Greg and Dave, you know, what that plan would look like. So I, I did it like that where I, you know, gave exam- exact examples of what it was going to be and mm-hmm. what the style of the training right up till the games, right, Aromas, July 10th, you know. Uh, so pretty much you can see there I had like six weeks of training um, that whole year because really I wasn't training. I was training probably two or three times a week because I was coaching more other people and getting them interested in it. And my business was um, raising tune strength conditioning. So, so basically, when it came down to it, I didn't train long enough, right? I had I had six weeks of high peak training, which mm-hmm. is great, which got me to Sunday. Um, but you know, I barely made it through that hill. You ask anyone who did the hill sprint with the sandbags, that was one of the worst workouts ever. Yeah, um, that was just ridiculously painful. And was and, that was that like two hundred meters up the hill? I'm not sure, brother. It felt like a kilometer. Yeah. But I, after that, and then doing the row, I was lucky on the row. Um, that, was, that was a stupid event. I was lucky on the row because I had, like, every time I hit that thing, it was going down, like, two inches. So was, you yeah. know, um, so it was just a row and hit that and come back. I wasn't as unlucky as some other guys with the positioning. But um, the row didn't wreck me that much. But that did, the hill climb. And then that night, the snatch and the wall balls. I was working on enzymes. I was probably working on like my twelve year old enzymes. You know, I was digging I was digging deep, way yeah. down, uh, where seventy five pounds felt like hundred and fifty pounds. I was doing singles, to give you an example, for a seventy five pound squat snatch. So that'd give you a perspective as to as to how messed up I was. Yeah. And then I had to try to do three workouts the next day. I didn't sleep that night. I tried to eat a lot on Saturday night. Um, I started at hundred and sixty seven pounds on Friday. Mm-hmm. I was one fifty nine by Sunday morning. Wow. Perspective. Um, and this was with trying to keep all food in. And, you know, yeah. uh, if you look at the pictures too, I was pretty messed up. And then uh, after the second workout, the first one was a snatch. It was heavy, so it didn't mess me up nervous system wise. The second one, I dug in. And uh, luckily enough, based on my body weight, it was only me and Miko and Pat Burke really that didn't have a problem with the handstand push ups and, um, and getting through things. And, um, and Jason as well. Um, but anyhow, I was able to get through that one and still have a good standing. And, uh, you know, you're just willing it in your head. And from that workout up until the next one, there was stuff going on in my body, like 
you know, peeing, you know, little droplets of golden nuggets to like peeing mm -hmm. for two minutes straight to, you know, cramping in my abdominal section to like my vision starting to close in and I'd go into the bathroom and use the bathroom and look in the mirror and just start to almost break down, you know, so there's stuff going on. I was like, okay, this is not, yeah. this is not good, but you try to will yourself, try to do a couple of muscle ups because I knew they were in the first part of the workout, I think. Um, and then I started cramping in my brachioradialis and my VMO. So I was like, okay, let's get on the table and start loosening it up. And as soon as they started touching me and moving stuff, my body just started to go into like um, a shutdown mode. And I know what that felt like um, in terms of description that other athletes had given me from some endurance athletes actually from um, Ironman or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or long distance stuff. And um, yeah, your brain plays this nasty back and forth of, you know, you can will yourself to do it and then you try and, yeah, so it was upsetting because, uh, uh, you know, I was going against what my, what my body said and, and, uh, but, um, it is what it is and, uh, how long, lots, take, lots from it. how long did it take to recover from that, from that whole episode? I, do, I had to do lots of, um, a medical intervention pretty much, um, you know, uh, my adrenals took a, took a big smash, um, as well as, you know, all anabolic hormones you know I had the hormones of a 92 year old mm -hmm. for months and months after that um so I had you know it took me about took me till Christmas I think to basically come around and uh um just from that because that period of training up to going you know pushing it past what you're supposed to um it took me a while I haven't really recovered from that since um in terms of like you know performances and stuff but um I tried to rework the system um and up to, you know, for the, so for the following games the year after, I was like, okay, Christmas forward, I just want to be healthy again, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I took that attitude going into the next games that I just wanted to be um, just, you know, healthy fitness, and yeah. not, not CrossFit, because I knew that I wasn't as good as a shitload of other guys that were in there, but I was lucky enough to be able to go down and compete. So I was happy that I was able to just be there for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I switched gears after that year, um, and I said, you know, I'm going to give it a go again. Um, and I, I, you know, I really thought halfway through the year, like coming into November, December, January, I was making claims that, you know, I was going to win this again, or I was going to come back and do this, because I thought in my head, like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's my feeling, so I can say what I want, but I really thought that I was going to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and for my training year leading up to the Games 2011, um, things were going that way. Um, where I'd done some good competitions, some competitions on my own, and I was basically, you know, stronger than ever, and you know, because the game had changed in terms of being strong, and um, I revamped the system and learned a lot from what I was doing and coaching other people as to how to be in the sport and do it effectively and, and plan it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I really thought that it was going to be, a, you know, a good year and good time, and then, um, yeah, some stuff happened where. Um, uh, there seemed to be a little bit of a, a miscommunication and and um, a lack of. Um, there seemed to be some kind of out of thin air of disparity between OPT and CrossFit that arised. Okay. Uh, and I'm not sure where that came from, but it kind of just soured me, and I uh, went back to my little hole and just coaching people and and forgot about myself. It felt a little uh, uh, felt a little off in terms of being a competitor again for that. Yeah. But, was that around the time that you were motivated to develop the certification program for coaches, or was, did you already have that in place? No, that was in place. Um, uh, that was in place uh, early early 2010. So I had mm -hmm. been, yeah, I had been uh, doing that coaching program for over a year. You know, 12, 14, 15 months. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And what was your motivation to develop that coaching program? Yeah, uh, man, it was just, uh, I guess it's just evolution because I was coaching for such a long period of time and you get so many clients across your desk where they're like, man, you got to do a book or you got to you gotta tell people about this stuff or, you know, and you just change so many individual people's lives. Um, it's a natural progression where then you get, you'd, I'd get coaches coming to work with me just mm -hmm. to be a client. And uh, they were like, man, you got, you know, so much shit to share and I had so much to say, you know, um, and, uh, and the, I, I call it, I call it like a, just a, 
a John Nash moment where I had you know a couple of days where I was just drawing shit up and put I just I just basically threw up everything mm-hmm. that I had basically put together because remember like my experiences leading up to CrossFit I thought I knew everything within strength and conditioning you know yeah um, and then you get into CrossFit and then it switches gears all together because I had been with the endurance community and geeked out on strength and conditioning and now with CrossFit I had this beautiful blend of the full spectrum that I was like this is a package now that I can put together based upon what fitness is, right? Mm-hmm. And I knew we had these different pieces, so I investigated what our business was made up of, nutritional consulting, which was a big part, um, physical assessment, pro- how to do a program design, how to run a business properly, and then life coaching. Um, and so the mix of those five things, I came up with a design on what it was going to be for a coaching certification program. <laughs> and God loved the people that were in the first courses because I was just like spewing years of information <laughs> incorrectly they were like you know oh my god is it, you know is this going to be over soon kind of thing um i can remember dutch lowey and cj martin um in some of those early classes they, they were just like you know <laughs> i talked i think for eight hours straight on the first saturday to give an example but anyways that was the makeup of the ccp i just felt like i had to create a legacy component to kind of like passing information on because i really felt there was a missing link in me creating this real big p- change, you know. Like, we all want to have some purpose, you know. Yeah. And uh, my purpose was, like, to, to put, really put an impact on creating change in terms of coaching, coaching fitness. And um, so that's where, where that came. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can, you, can you talk a bit about the higher orders of thinking as taught in your coaching program with Bernie Novikowski? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, Bernie passed away last week. Um, oh, wow which I, I saw your question come up uh, yeah. previous to this too. And uh, um, so it's a little bit sad for me to speak of or speak about. I still haven't, you know, truly come to grasp with it. But um, the, because it, it was basically like, because we're in different areas now. We used to live together or live in the same area in Calgary. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was my business and life mentor um, since 2001 pretty much. Um and yeah, he's basically just he's basically a freaking legend in his in in terms of what higher order thinking means. And I'll try to explain it a little bit. It's basically built on the concept, built on these concepts of you know, of fundamental systematics that the universe has and everything within it. Um there's certain principles and guidelines and universal principles of of systems that if we look really closely at it aligns all things appropriately. And so um, within everything, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and so the higher order thinking was a process of, you know, aligning and organizing your thoughts so that your thinking was correct such that if you wanted to do anything, it would allow you to orchestrate that appropriately. And Mm -hmm. his teaching methods uh, basically were built upon that for me personally. So he used to do it or he did it for me personally, and I used to do contra training with him to try to help his health. Because at the time when I met him, he was still smoking cigars and drinking. Um, and then he had um, a shot with cancer, which really created an awakening. And after that, you know, I really felt, and all of our friends of Bernie's felt that, you know, you got to start passing this shit on, dude, because there's so much that you can help people with in terms of this awareness. So, um, it was a very easy fit for me because I was a life coach consultant when I would consult with people. So we started including it obviously in our CCP programs and coaches were fortunate enough to get to listen to Bernie speak about that. But mm-hmm. the higher order thinking process, if I was to break it into a few words for your listeners, is to is basically a concept of understanding awareness, um, of being aware um, and noticing. And so these things, the simple concepts like that, lead into good life coaching practices. Life coaching is a real improperly used word today, but, um, you know, helping people um, and, and resonating with folks. Mm-hmm. That's where the higher order thinking concepts uh, were developed and came into play. And that's, that's taught in your coaching program. Is that taught anywhere else? Is there anywhere people could go to learn more? Uh, no, Bernie was the only, Bernie was the, the gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. on that one um, and we were, we we're so fortunate that he was able to teach a bunch of his graduates uh, of the higher order thinking program I was one of them one of one of uh, few 
Um, and also the involvement now of the HOT stuff within the CCP program will be passed on. So the OPT CCP program is the only place really where um, people can get those kind of concepts. Okay. Mm-hmm. It'd be cool to do like uh, put a video out or something like that just kind of on it and, you know, just so people can kind of hear about it if they if they haven't yet. Yeah, I hear you. Um, that's noted. Thank you. Okay. Um, what do you think are the biggest ideas, attitudes, or qualities that are missing in the overall fitness community? Uh, what are the qualities that are missing in the fitness community? Well, um, I guess you can only speak them from my eyes and my perceptions because I guess it takes one to know one, but... Um, I think um, more of a focus on open-mindedness and um, so I think open-mindedness is missing and mm-hmm. I think uh, um, a perspective of the client is missing. So what I mean by that is open-mindedness meaning that there's a number of different ways to skin the cat and you got to be per- you got to be open to that and not be biased in terms of what you were how you learned mm-hmm. and how you made a change and think that everyone should follow that direction. Um, you know, and then secondly, that in the, in fitness, um, I guess I'll speak in terms of fitness coaching and fitness coaching. It's so much about, um, the coach and the business and we forget that it's all about the client. Um, so the client has to tell us what the goals are. I'm not going to tell you what you need to do. Mm -hmm. You need to tell me what the direction is. And my goal is to guide you on that on the correct incremental normal normalcy path um, and not say, this is what we're doing, you mm-hmm. know, yeah. uh, welcome, jump on in. So um, I think that, that you know, those, are, those are two pieces that could be missing. Within the, um, just in terms of a big picture for fitness, um, I think quality control, um, you know, there's, I'm, I'm sure there's, are, you know, philosophical arguments to it everywhere, but it seems that everyone, and I, maybe I'm biased, but it seems that everyone can teach fitness today. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to meet a middle ground on that where it's like I saw, you know, some people's personal training programs or certifications and you had to spend eight years in order to do it. And I understood it because there's complexities involved. And then, and then there's some weekend courses where those kind, those people can teach fitness. And then they're, they're, you know, trying to get lower costs from one another across the street to develop the best fitness program for people that we're trying to help. But just in any profession, um, I think there's a lack of quality control in terms of who uh, who teaches fitness, um, that anyone can do that. And, uh, you know, one of these days there's going to come a time where someone's going to call themselves a trainer and they're going to they're gonna hurt the wrong person mm-hmm. and uh, something's going to happen. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, what do you think are some of the best parts of the overall fitness community? Um, I think um, I think that this uh, call it a CrossFit movement, whether you know, depending upon, um, I guess in the early two thousands, um, this perspective that fitness can be done differently mm-hmm. is probably the biggest positive thing, you know. Um, and, you know, many people can see it as a negative, um, but you just got to see it the right way that it's a very positive thing to really start looking at fitness. Because it changes the landscape of, of course, who, you know, what we do for people's fitness program. Remember, we're not just doing, you know, weight training and cardio on the treadmill anymore. Mm-hmm. So that has, you know... Um, some people have done different kinds of energy system training before, um, and ironically think they know what energy system training is today. Um, but the, this mixed modal, uh, training, call what you want, if you, if I want to call it cross or you want to call it circuit training or the, the, the concepts of circuit training or the, the dose response that we're investigating for, for, uh, circuit training or mixed modal work. I think that stuff is a is a really positive turn for fitness mm-hmm. because it makes it better for the client. Um, it makes it more exciting. It makes it more enjoyable. They improve on different skills. It makes fitness more enjoyable. There's just a, no other way to say it, you know. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, last question for you. What ideas, discussions, or discoveries have been interesting to you lately? Um, man, I got a whole board of them here. We do, uh, um, Max, uh, myself do, uh, you know, those uh, think tank sessions like that on these concepts of what we try on people. And um, I guess some of the big ones is the, is the dose response of, of uh, mixed modal training. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to create um, these standardized uh, tests to determine exactly what makes someone more fit than another in terms of mixed modal training. Okay. Um, so what are the concepts that allow people to do that and how do you, how do you try to measure that scientifically? Mm -hmm. you know? So if we had you know, 20 males and 20 females all unfit and we gave them all mixed mobile training, and after two years we saw them again, and we, you know, so what? What is the thing within some of these people? Let's call them the three, the outliers of twenty, that made them get better at that kind of training. That's mm, the kind okay. of stuff that we're investigating. Like, um, you know, so we're we're doing scientific investigation from a from a standardized measurement position, just mm -hmm. so we could see exactly if any of those things are the are the outliers. So. VO2 max, force expiratory volume, um, lactate balance point testing, body composition and anthropometrics, um, nutrition, previous training. So get all that in one area and basically look at all those points and then try to put together some newer concepts like uh, heart rate variability and adaptation to stress and skill adaptation and breathing adaptation, respiratory exchange ratio when, when modalities change. Those are the kind of things we're looking at investigating to try to figure out what's that, what are those little, little missing links so that we can make basically a better coaching prescription um, and also, you know, some of those, just you know, get, get, a, get answered to some of those burning questions that we have. So I guess those, that's one of, the, one of the things we have going on. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, thank you, James, so much for your time, man. No problem. And you no have problem. a good one, brother. Okay. All the best. All right, Body Hackers, I hope you enjoyed that interview. If you have anyone you think would make for a good interview, go ahead and email me at spencer at bodyhack.com. And if you want to hear more interviews like this one, not exactly the same though, go ahead and check out bodyhack.com and then click the link to the blog. See you later.